This nation has always been defined by a dream. A dream to achieve and live beyond the fold. Innovation, creativity, and freedom are hallmarks of this American dream. But this dream comes with a cost. And it's not preserved without self-sacrifice. The men and women who serve our country are not just soldiers. They are defenders of freedom. They are protectors of our rights to pursue happiness. We use words like honor, courage, and bravery to describe our veterans. They have taken turns standing guard over the dream that makes America so special. The freedom to live, love, and worship God is possible because of our veterans. This is what makes America so special and what makes our veterans heroes. all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. Together we are his house, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Don't think that you're just some ordinary well, you are ordinary, we're all ordinary, but we're built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Yeah. And the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. We are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Through him, you are also being made a part of this dwelling where God lives by his spirit. That's a whole, a whole mouthful, isn't it? That we are part of God's family. We are sons and daughters of the Most High King. We roll that off of our tongues because it's a cliche. But the thing about it is, is it's the truth. And that we are built, who we are in Christ is built upon him, the cornerstone the apostles and the prophets who we can't even begin to think of ourselves in the same room with, much less connected with. Amen? Anybody else feel that way? Um, so let's stand and worship the one who accomplishes that. I'm 
Christ, we thank you that you are the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. There are so many times that we have to just literally fall on the truth of that statement. God, we thank you that you give us the opportunity to come and worship you. God, as we enter into this next song, I ask that you draw us close. Where literally you could whisper and we would hear you loud and clear. Over and above all the noise, all the noise of, of our lives, all the burdens and the, and the joys and the things that we drag into this building. God, we want to come and just spend this time with you. Listen to your heart for each one of us and for this church. God, we come. Some of us will only feel comfortable to come within a few feet of you. Some of us just at your feet. And some of us right up into your lap. God, we thank you that you are gentle and you are gracious and you are merciful. And there is no standard that we have to meet but just to come as far as we can come. This morning draws closer.
deal. I'm not saying that. In fact, I, there's someone here that is supposed to come up and stand right here in the middle and face the congregation and sing. You have a word for us. You have a testimony for us. So don't, don't, don't fail me now, God. Don't fail me now. It is just not up to the three of us to lead. We are a church full of people who are capable of leading. Amen. We're thankfully, we're not in a place where we're all chiefs and no Indians. No, we're not that. But we each have a word. We have a testimony to give. It's not just the three of us, the four of us, the five of us. It's just not Rick. All right? It's got to be all of you. It has got to be all of you. Because if you're going to stand on us, you're, you're, you're hurting. Because <laughs> there are days that we don't stand. There are days that we're on our knees. We're curled up in a fetal ball at the foot of Jesus. We're no different than you. And so I'm asking that if you feel like you need to stand up here and say, you are holy, holy. You can just sing the words. I'm not, I, I know I'm asking a lot. And there may be more than one of you that goes, yes, I can do that. I can do that. There are words at the back. You don't have to worry that you're going to miss the words. And who cares anyway, because I make up words all the time. So it doesn't make any difference. It doesn't make it. Thank you, Sylvia. Let's stand up and sing to the one who gives us faith, who creates miracles in our lives, who strengthens us and makes us persevere when things get tough. God, we come. this room but are watching this you can stand you can stand in front of your phone you can stand in front of your computer you can stand in front of your TV and you can give the same testimony you can cry out to God you are holy 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 for me Every time I sing that, and those words, holy, holy, it, it means something it goes deeper inside of me. The truth of that blossoms just a little bit more. And it will be the same for you. It will be the same for you. So God, I ask for each one of us that as we sing that chorus one more time, that the truth that we serve a holy God who is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. 
He who created us and knit us together so very carefully. There are days when I think, oh, he should have been a little more careful with that one because I'm not quite measuring up, but that's not him, that's me. God, I thank you that you, you created us in such detail. Such detail. I thank you for the experiences of each one of our lives, the good and the bad, that brought us to this holy, anointed place. To this day, that we can cry out to you and know the truth of the statement. You are holy. said. Amen. Amen. All right. We are returning to um, to our children's song. So today I'm going to ask the kids to come up and uh, Katie's going to come and help me. We're going to sing a favorite song from our preschool called It's a Beautiful Day, and is it not a beautiful day today? <laughs> After all the rain we had. Kids, we're going to have you come and stand right in front of the rail. Katie's going to stay right there to help you. And you can, you can face me, if you like, and do the motions. That way you won't get embarrassed. Uh, but, or you can turn around and face the people. And we have some instruments to pass out. And so they're going to pass out instruments so that everyone can participate in this song. So, if you'd like to play an instrument, shake a shaker or ding a dinger or beat a beater, whatever. We have technical names for all of these, but we're not going to use them. All right, passing out those eggs and rattles. We're going to shake, rattle, and roll today. Yeah. Okay, here's how the song goes. And uh, we'll sing it a couple of times so you can get the feel of it, get the rhythm going, the kids can get into the motions. It's going to go like this. It's a beautiful day, and I thank God for the weather. It's a beautiful day, and I'm living it for my Lord. It's a beautiful day. And I know things are going to get better Living each day by the promises in God's Word Okay, now we're going to pretend that all of those folks are not here And you're at Preschool Chapel, remember Preschool Chapel? And how you would dance around when we sang this song And how you would just feel the joy of the Lord That's what I want you to do, here we go It's a beautiful day And I thank God for the weather day, and I'm living it for my Lord. It's a beautiful day, and I know things are going to get better, living each day by the promises in God's Word. One more time, here we go. It's a beautiful day. Let me hear you sing. And I thank God for the weather. Let me hear you. It's a beautiful day. Pitiful, living it for my Lord. Now sing it out. Here we go. It's a beautiful day, and I know things are going to get better. Living each day by the promises of, living each day by the promises of, 
living each day by the promises of God's Word. All right. Not bad. Not bad. Some of you uh, r rollers and shakers out there did pretty well. Thanks, guys. Thanks for coming. Let's pray before you go. Father, thank you for this beautiful day, and thank you for the joy that we can experience in our hearts as we sing our praise to you. Bless us today, watch over us, and keep us safe. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thanks, guys. All right. It's time for us to enter into a season of prayer. And uh, before we do that, though, I'm going to invite uh, those who are joining us online to uh, uh, begin praying for us as we share the joys and concerns in just a moment after our prayer of confession. Uh, and as we do that, you'll be praying and watching a short video, and then we'll come back and uh, lift up our prayers together. I do want to get my little gadget here so I can see what is being posted online for prayer requests. So let me get that set up and we'll get ready to go. First though, let's spend a few moments together, let's spend a few moments in quiet reflection as we consider the sins of our lives and then I'll offer a prayer of confession, then we'll break, okay? Here we go. Let us pray together. Gracious and loving God, we confess to you that we have sinned, we have fallen short of your glory, and we have fallen short of your demand for us to love you with all that we have and to love our neighbor as ourselves. Forgive us, cleanse us from all unrighteousness, and help us, God, to walk the path of righteousness through your strength and with your spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen. Right now, let's share the joys and concerns of our heart.
gracious and loving God, we gather in the name of Jesus to worship you and to lift up our hearts to you in prayer. You've heard the joys and concerns of our hearts as we've spoken them and as we've uh, identified them in our hearts. And so we lift them up to you, God, and we pray for healing for those who are in need of healing. We pray for comfort for those in need of comfort. We pray for strength for those who are weak, guidance for those who are wandering. We thank you for returning our friends from journeys. We pray that you be with those who are still on journeys and watch over them and bring them home safely. Help us, God, to please you with how we treat one another and how, how we share your love with others. Let us be winsome disciples and winsome witnesses for you, for your kingdom. Pray for our neighborhoods, our community, our cities, our state, and our nation. We pray that you would bless those who are in power, give them your wisdom, help them to work with one another for the betterment of all. And we pray for our world. We pray for peace in Ukraine and elsewhere and ask that you would raise up your beloved children to stand for peace and for justice throughout the world. We thank you for those who serve us locally in police uniform and firefighter uniform, and we especially thank you for those veterans who are serving or who have served in defense of our country and in our way of life. Bless them and encourage them, protect them, those who are deployed, bring them home safely, that they may be reunited with their families and friends with joy. We pray in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, who taught us to pray with these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. It is time for the offering. And as such, we, uh, we don't pass the plate, but there is a joy box in the back. You're welcome to drop your offerings off there or follow the instructions on the screen or the back of your bulletin to make your contributions in other ways. Whatever way you choose, we thank you for your continued support of and um, undergirding of the ministry of the fount. Now our beloved quartet is going to sing an offering for us. So this morning, if you'll notice in your bulletins that there is a heavy emphasis on the understanding of trust. And I won't spoil the sermon. I don't want to get in trouble. You can't spoil the sermon. That's man. true. I really can't. I don't want to spoil the, the thematic messaging of the sermon. I can't do that. And Moving on. This is a great calling to trust when things seem uncertain and to obey when you are told what to do. i 
comes from you, and everything belongs to you. Thank you for blessing us so abundantly in so many ways. We offer these gifts back to you now, and we pray that they'll be used to further your kingdom. We pray in Jesus' name. I wouldn't sit down yet. <laughs> we are moving on to our middle hymn for the service. This is called, I Will Trust in the Lord. This may be a little unfamiliar. It's a little bit more of a gospel hymn. So I'm going to ask real quick if Hannah would play the melody so that you may hear what it sounds like so you're not completely caught off guard. The melody of the piece, 464. Alrighty, here we go, 464, would you stand and join us? for today is Proverbs 3, 9, and 10. Honor the Lord with your substance and with the first fruits of all your produce. 
Then your barns will be filled with plenty, and your vats will be bursting with wine. May God bless the reading of his word. Preaching on giving is always a problem. Some people think that the church is always asking for their money. Of course, if you only come a couple of times a year, chances are you're going to hear a higher percentage of messages on money. Dig. The reality is, though, money and possessions are important spiritual elements in one's life. Satan loves to confuse the body of Christ on this issue because he knows that Christians will miss out on a tremendous blessing if they are confused. He wants to hurt the church, and he wants to hurt the members of the church, so he sows seeds of confusion about giving. It is a spiritual matter. The Bible has a lot to say about money. There are 500 verses on prayer, 500 verses on faith, and over 2,000 verses on money and giving. Much of the law involves money or the agrarian equivalent of livestock or crops. Of the 40 or so parables that Jesus gave, 16 of them are about money. Money is so important a spiritual principle that the Bible says that the love of money is the derivation of all evil. 1 Timothy 6.10 says, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, and in their eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. Hebrews 13 verse 5 says, Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Think about it. Money is a very important element in our lives. Why wouldn't the Bible address the element frequently? And it's true, we do ask for money a lot because most people don't practice faithful giving. If every believer practiced faithful giving, we would never have to raise money. One of my favorite cartoons from years ago is of a man being baptized, of course, fully immersed. And as he goes under the water, the symbolism of him being made clean all over, he's shown doing this. He doesn't want his wallet baptized because he wouldn't, he wouldn't want to have it under the authority of God. You know, if every believer practiced faithful giving, we would never have to do a finance campaign. There would be no second mile pledges, no special appeals to help meet our budget. God has set a principle. He set this out for us. If we would be faithful to observe it, we would always have enough because we could be sure that we had what, was, what God wanted us to have. Anything more would be sinful. Anything less is unfaithful. I would love to try this idea out. The reason I'm preaching on this is not to raise money for the church or to raise money for my salary or to, to make you feel guilty, but to teach an important principle. Faithful giving brings rich blessings in one's life and it will help you to grow spiritually. I'm not going to apologize for preaching about something that will help you to grow spiritually. If this sermon offends you, get over it. If you put into practice what I'm going to teach you today, you will be blessed. I promise that. As your pastor, I want you to experience the blessing of faithful giving. Please do not feel guilt or condemnation. That's what the enemy wants you to feel. The Lord wants you to feel, wants to give you more and more blessings. That's his, that's his goal. He wants you to simply trust him that his word is true. So what is the principle of stewardship? First and foremost, it is that God is the owner of everything. Psalm 24 verse 1 says this, the earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. 
The principle of stewardship says, first of all, that everything belongs to God. So what we own, we really don't own, but we manage or care for what really belongs to God. The word steward is translated from the Greek oikonomos, oiko meaning house and nomo meaning manage. We are charged with taking care of what is God's. The house belongs to God. We are charged with managing it. When we talk about private ownership, we have to be conscious that biblically we really don't own anything. At most, we are borrowing it for a while. But even better, we are caring for that which belongs to someone else. That's the principle of stewardship. We don't own it, we just take care of it. Now what about the tithe, giving of the tithe? Let's think of it in terms of uh, the sermon series just completed about the genres of the scriptures. Let's think about it in terms of the law, wisdom, and the prophetic. Most Christians who object to the tithe, which is 10% of one's income, they object to it from the position that it is Old Testament law, which is true. It is the law in the Old Testament. Look at Leviticus chapter 27, verses 30 through 32. It says, all tithes from the land, whether the seed from the ground or the fruit from the tree, are the Lord's. They are holy to the Lord. If persons wish to redeem any of their tithes, they must add one-fifth to them. All tithes of herd and flock, every tenth one that passes under the shepherd's staff, shall be holy to the Lord. And then in Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 22, it says, Set apart a tithe for all the yield of your seed that is brought in yearly from the field. According to our study of the law genre in Scripture, we know that any Old Testament law that is not specifically renewed in the New Testament is not binding on Christians. And the law of the tithe is not renewed in the New Testament. So it is not binding as law for the New Testament believers. But the tithe is also part of the prophetic. In Malachi, the, the prophet Malachi, chapter 3, verses 8 through 10, it says, Will anyone rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, How are we robbing you? In your tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, so that there may be food in my house. And thus put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. See if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you an overflowing blessing. Remember what the test for the prophetic is? Context. You have to understand the context of the oracle. The context for Malachi is the people of Israel had returned from the exile and rebuilt the temple but they were not being faithful in bringing in the full tithe required by the law to God. They were plagued by drought and famine, natural deterrence to tithing. But God says through Malachi that the drought and the famine is a result of their disobedience, and God would send plentiful rain and blessing if the people would only be faithful. Translate that to today. Obedience brings abundance. Disobedience brings scarcity. But tithing is a principle, a standard, not a law. It's a spiritual discipline. It is taught in the wisdom literature also of the Bible. If you look for a standard of giving in the Bible, again and again you will run into the tithe. Sometimes you will find more than a tithe. At times in Israel, God required up to 30% from the Israelites. And Jesus commends the widow who gave all she had rather than the rich folks who gave only what was to them a small amount. Luke 21, verses 1 through 4 says this, He looked up and saw rich people putting their gifts into the treasury. He saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins. And he said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them, for all of them have contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in all she had to live on. But the tithe, most biblical scholars will say, is the biblical standard of giving for the people of God. So if you want to know what the Bible says we should give, it starts 
with the tithe. That's the minimum. And the experience of most people that I know who tithe is that God blesses them through their faithful giving. Cindy and I have experienced that when we are faithful and give at least a tithe of our income, God blesses us, and we always have enough. Giving becomes a joy rather than a duty because we know we are practicing faithful giving. How many of you have found that by tithing, God has blessed you? But it's not about how much money we give. It's about how much we trust God. The principle of first fruits gives us the key to that. There's a story from from Africa, a knock on the door of a hut occupied by a missionary in Africa. In answering the door, the missionary found one of the native boys holding a large fish in his hands. The boy said, Reverend, you taught us what tithing is, so here I've brought you my tithe. As the missionary gratefully took the fish, he questioned the young lad, if this is your tithe, where are the other nine fish? At this, the boy beamed and said, oh, they're still back in the river. I'm going back to catch them now. (laughs) First fruits, or first fish, if you will. The important thing about the tithe is not the 10%, but that it is the first Giving God the first of our produce shows faith that he will provide the rest and bless it. Listen to our text again from Proverbs 3, verses 9 and 10. Honor the Lord with your substance and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. We honor the Lord by giving from the first of our income. Conversely, we dishonor the Lord when we give only what's left over. Say I do some work for you and you pay me $100 in $10 bills. How much is the tithe of that? $10. But which $10 bill is the first one? You gave me all 10 at once. Which one is the first one? It's the first one I spend. The first one I spend. When we give the first 10% rather than the last, 10% or whatever, we are showing that we trust God to provide the rest, like the African fishermen above. This principle can be seen in, in this passage from the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 26, verses 1 through 11. It's an extended passage, so if you want to open to Deuteronomy 26, please do. Deuteronomy 26, 1 through 11. When you have come into the land that the Lord your God has given you as an inheritance to possess, and you possess it and settle in it, you shall take some of the first of the fruit of the ground which you harvest from the land that the Lord your God has given you, and you shall put it in a basket and go to the place that the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling for his name. You shall go to the priest who is in office at that time and say to him, Today I declare to the Lord your God that I have come into the land that the Lord swore to our ancestors to give us. When the priest takes the basket from your hand and sets it down before the altar of the Lord your God, you shall make this response before the Lord your God. A wandering Aramean was my ancestor, and he went down into Egypt and lived there as an alien, few in number, and there he became a great nation, mighty and populous. When the Egyptians treated us harshly and afflicted us, By imposing hard labor on us, we cried to the Lord, the God of our ancestors. The Lord heard our voice and saw our affliction, our toil, and our oppression. The Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, with a terrifying display of power and with signs and wonders. And he brought us into this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. So now I bring the first of the fruit of the ground that you, O Lord, have given me. And you shall set it down before the Lord your God and bow down before the Lord your God. Then you, together with the Levites and the aliens who reside among you, shall celebrate with all the bounty that the Lord your God has given to you and to your house. True tither gives the first 10% of their income to the Lord. And it becomes an act of worship. Remember, uh, those of you who studied the purpose-driven life, 
Worship is whatever we do to show God that we love him. Tithing is an act of worship. God must be first in everything. God wants to be first in your life. Matthew 6, 24 says, No one can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. People want to serve God and fill in the blank all the time. But God will not share the first place in your life. And he won't be second or third or fourth. He will be first or not at all. Exodus 23, 19 says, The choicest of the first fruits of your ground you shall bring unto the house of the Lord your God. So the blessing of the first tithing, the first fruits, it's not a prosperity gospel. This is not a scheme to get rich. Some teach this, and it is heresy. Tithing the first 10% is not an investment plan that will result in guaranteed financial windfalls, but a lifestyle of faithfulness, faithful stewardship. I believe for Christians, giving the first 10% back to God is the starting point, and I believe that the tithe is best given to a person's local community, local church, Offerings are over and above the tithe and may be given to any as the Lord directs. But we have no business, no business giving offerings if we haven't fulfilled the tithe. It's not a law, it's a principle. And it is a spiritual discipline, much like fasting and prayer. When we tithe off the top, the first 10%, we find ourselves living closer to God's ideal and blessings will result. Listen again to Proverbs 3, 9 and 10. Honor the Lord with your substance and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. I believe that the church is missing out on a lot of opportunities to serve God because the people of God are not faithful in their giving. I believe that the church would have all it needs to do all that God calls it to do, that we would never have to raise money it would just, if we would just practice faithful stewardship of the resources God has entrusted to us. He says, he says that he will provide plenty. Why do we doubt? Every time we get paid, we say something to God. A non-tither says to God, I don't trust you. I don't believe you. I am grateful. I'm not grateful. I don't trust you that you can and will provide for me and my family's needs, so I'm going to hold on to my money until I see that there is enough. Then I'll give you something. The tither, on the other hand, says every time they get paid, I trust you. I believe in your word. I believe that you will pour out your abundant blessings and that I will, and I will have more than enough. Why would we hold on to 100% that is not blessed when we could have 90% that is blessed? Now, that's silliness, of course, because it, it's not about money. But just consider what living out this principle would mean. This doesn't mean that if you give the first 10% of your income to the Lord that automatically the rest will be supernaturally protected. We still have to practice good stewardship. We have to take care of the 90%, not living beyond our means and practicing poor financial management. But if we are careful, that's what stewardship is, God will bless. Malachi invites us to test this principle in Malachi 3, verse 10. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house, and thus put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. See if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you an overflowing blessing. First fruits, 10%. I, too, invite you to put the Lord to the test and see. Now let's spend a few moments in prayerful reflection as we consider what God may be saying to our hearts.
number 525. If you all will stand and join me in singing this song. This is another one that we're not familiar with, but we're going to learn it. Amen. <laughs> had it toward the end. Yeah. It's good. Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. That's it for today. I feel like I'm finishing the daily devotions. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you for joining us online. Thank you for worshiping the Lord together with us here at the Fount. May the Lord bless you and go with you and walk with you and stay with you always. May he guide your steps and bring you safely to the destination he's called you. In Jesus' name. Hey, Jackson.